Paul Finkelman. Paul Finkelman is involved in an amazing amount of things, most recently, and when I say recently, like yesterday, Justice Elena Kagan, in a Supreme Court opinion, referenced the Paul Finkelman brief. How many people can say that? That's high-level stuff. And Paul, three times now, has been mentioned in a United States Supreme Court opinion. That alone is worth getting his autograph. And among other things, Paul is currently the Justice Pike Hall Jr. Visiting Professor at the Paul A. Bear Law Center at LSU. He came up here from the Bayou country just to be part of us today. The Paul A. Bear uh, was, in fact, a just judge, a judge in one of the subsequent Nuremberg trials. So Paul's got to connect just through his current uh, location, but in addition, Paul is a long-standing scholar in many, many areas, including Robert H. Jackson. Uh, Paul, just to go through his bio, and it, it is fun to go through, he is a specialist in American legal history, constitutional law, race relationships, and the law, and the First Amendment, an author of more than 150 scholarly articles and 30 books. His work has been cited by the United States Supreme Court, as I mentioned most recently yesterday. Additionally, the works appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, USA Today, and Huffington Post. He's appeared in programs on C-SPAN, PBS, and the History Channel, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on and on. Uh, I just assume to hear uh, from Paul, but one of the things that, uh, he wasn't here at the time, but we uh, uh, sang earlier, Paul, uh, a little happy birthday to Willie Mays. And I know that this is, does not, probably doesn't have a whole lot to do with Underground Railroad Law and Legacy, maybe. Um, but what's your reflections on Willie Mays? It's, it's, it's always fun to come here, you know. <laughs> okay, so my only Willie Mays story is that I um, uh, spent some time with the person who's the head of the rare books collection and the treasure room at the Baseball Hall of Fame, a librarian. Uh, they have things in there like uh, uh, Cy Young's contract and um, they have a little file um, on Eddie Goodell. How many of you know who Eddie Goodell was? Um, Eddie Goodell was the midget that was put up to bat uh, for the St. Louis Browns. Uh, he had a, a, the number one eighth on his back. And this, this, was, this was a publicity stunt by Bill Veck. And apparently, um, the, it resulted in a file like this thick from Major League Baseball called the Midget Question, uh, because they were so freaked out by what he had done. Uh, but in any event, um, so in talking to the, this man who's met all of the great players of, of the last 30 or 40 years, and all of the sports writers, I asked him, you know, who was the, the greatest player? And he said, he, he asked sports writers the question, who would you pay to play, to see play? That is, these sports writers get free tickets all the time. Who would you buy a ticket to watch play? And they universally said the only person who they would pay to watch would have been Willie Mays. Um, and, and surely he was uh, the most exciting player well, of I, his generation. Um, not perhaps, um, I mean, it's hard to know what the best player of any generation is, uh, but he certainly, um, no one was more exciting. Well, of course, this uh, a perfect segue to the most important question here that we're going to talk about is the fact that Willie Mays played for the New York Giants, the San Francisco Giants, and perhaps the most prolific home run hitter uh, in Major League history, albeit under some sort of cloud at this point, who also was from the San Francisco Giants, and his name was Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds hit a home run, which broke the record the last day, the 73rd home run, I believe. And there was a scuffle. There was a scuffle, and you may recall, uh, let's see, who owned the baseball? Uh, there was a guy who actually caught it, then there was a rumble and a rugby a match that ensued, and ultimately somebody else came up with the baseball, and the question was of ownership. And guess who was the expert witness in the trial dealing with the ownership of the Barry Bonds baseball, and this, like I say, most important question, was Paul Finkelman. In a Reader's Digest format, could you tell us your role in all of that? Well, I, um, I was the only, you, you may wonder, I know many of you are, are, are lawyers, how many of you are attorneys here? 
Okay, so you're all here. Uh, you're only here because you need CLE credit. And, and, and this is a hell of a lot easier than worrying about the latest nuance of, of the New York uh, uh, rules of procedure um, uh, or something like that. But um, in law school, you, you probably knew that some of your professors occasionally wrote law review articles. And uh, you may wonder, you know, why do we do this since often we write on fairly arcane subjects? Um, in 2001, I wrote a law review article on why a fan owns a home run ball if the fan catches the ball. Uh, even my dean, who had fairly liberal notions of what legal scholarship was, kind of scratched his head and said, you know, why are you doing this? And I said, because this gets to the very essence of the ownership of unowned property. Because once that ball goes over the fence, it's, it's no longer owned by the home team. And it's not owned by anyone. So, and of course, some of you may remember your first year property class. You took, uh, you may have had a case called Pearson versus Post, which involves a fox, where Mr. Post is hunting the fox. He's just about to do the fox in, and Pearson pops out from behind the bushes and shoots the fox. Post rides off and grabs the fox, and Pearson sues to get the fox pelt back. Um, this is turns out, of course, Pearson and Post are neighbors. They hate each other's guts, and it's not really about the fox. It's about neighborliness or lack thereof. But <clears throat> it is the first case in many property books. Well, that case has now been superseded by uh, Popov versus Hayashi, which involved the baseball that Alex Popov caught and ended up in Hayashi's hands after, after Popov was essentially mugged. So before all this took place, though, be, before all of the, uh, the, the, the issue, um, that spring, Bonds had hit his 500th home run, landed in a body of water outside of uh, the giant stadium that was called McCovey Cove. People would get out there in rowboats trying to catch baseballs, which is kind of interesting, you know, sort of a, uh, it could be like an, a new Olympic event, right? You know, boating and baseball, and, and it's, it's, it's kind of like the biathlon where it's shooting and skiing, so this is rowing and baseball all in one, in one sport. Um, and the question came up, why does this guy own the ball? And there was a lot of internet chat among law professors with you know, brilliantly insightful things like finders keepers or possession <laughs> is nine tenths of the law. And I thought, well, you know, uh, we're law professors and we're scholars and we think this through. So I actually wrote a very long article on the entire history of why ownership transfers from the home team to the play to the fan. After all, if you catch a football in the stands, you have to give it back. If the basketball bounces into the stands, you don't get to keep it. Uh, until very recently, you had to return hockey pucks. Um, but why, uh, you know, why do you get to keep the baseball? So I wrote this article on why you own a baseball. And um, then three months later, uh, suddenly there's a lawsuit over why you own a baseball. And so, uh, it just shows that when we do scholarship in the academy, even the most arcane scholarship, scholarship that seems to have, <coughs> excuse me, that seems to have nothing whatsoever to do with legal practice or anything that's connected to reality, can suddenly pop up, so to speak, and, um, and be part of litigation. How did it end up? <coughs> Pardon? How did it end up? It ended up with the judge, and of course all of you can relate to this, the judge making an unbelievably stupid ruling. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Judge Jurassic. <laughs> uh, well, in fact, every judge I've ever talked to have said it's a stupid ruling. Uh, the judge, uh, this was just a, a trial court in San Francisco, uh, and the judge began the case by saying that he'd never been to a baseball game and never played baseball. I thought right there that was grounds for recusal, uh, uh, on the grounds that he was incompetent to hear the case. Uh, and he, in the end, said that the two men had a joint possessory interest, which if you check every legal dictionary and every website and anything else, you'll find there's no such terminology. He pulled it out of some part of his anatomy and put it as, into his opinion. Uh, and uh, the point is, we're not being taped, are we? No. Good. Uh, well, wait a minute, what's that? That light's off. Oh, good. <laughs> I don't, I don't want a bench warrant for me in San Francisco for cont contempt of stupid judges, you know. Uh, but but uh, the, uh, 
the, the fact is that there, there, this is, there, by the way, there's a wonderful movie called Up for Grabs, where I, it's a, a Hollywood documentary about the case. I'm in it for like 12 seconds, so that's my real claim to fame. I'm in a real movie. But if you see the, 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 the film clip, the ball goes directly into, uh, into Alexander Popov's glove. He catches the ball, he closes the ball, glove around the ball, brings the ball to his chest, and then about 12 people knock him down, and the ball ends up in somebody else's hands. Uh, to my way of thinking, this is an absolutely open and shut, simple case of possession. He caught the ball, it's his ball, and just because you mug somebody doesn't mean you can keep what you get from them. And in the opinion, the judge says that Mr. Popov is the victim of a mugging by a gang of thugs and then proceeds to offer half of the ownership of the ball to one of the people who is jumping on Hayashi, on Popov, that is one of the thugs. So I, I think it's an absolutely horrible uh, outcome uh, in terms of law, because essentially what it says is, is that the law, at least in San Francisco, and uh, Major League Baseball supports the notions that there should be you know, warfare in the stands. Uh, and that's not why we go to baseball games. Uh, we, we, um, <clears throat> so anyways, we could go on. You could bring me back and do this but, you know, for hours, but I, I probably should talk about the Underground Railroad. Well, there's a segue in all this. Watch me. I'm sure. Pearson versus Post, you gotta be kidding me. You realize what the last time any of you actually thought about it, let alone applied it? It would just blow my mind. Anyways, ownership of unowned property. You mentioned that. That was yes. the sort of the thesis. And it seems to be that is the segue into the story of the Underground Railroad Law and Legacy. You have anything to say about it? I'll try. Okay. Paul Finkelman. Thank you. Uh, So, so let me start by, by saying that, that, that the Underground Railroad is something that Americans have this enormous fascination with. I have been writing about fugitive slaves and the issue of slavery in the Constitution for most of my professional career. And whenever I go someplace and talk about the Underground Railroad, immediately people start telling me about the secret room in their house or the secret tunnel in their backyard. Uh, the most uh, bizarre one of these is if any of you go down to the southern tier to the town of Owego, New York. Uh, uh, Owego sits up above the Susquehanna River uh, about a couple hundred yards. It's kind of on a bluff, and along the road there are three tunnels that tunnel up into the to this cliff and take you right into the town of Owego. And these were probably built um, sometime in the 20th century to, to make it easier to bring things that land at, at the river and bring them up. But I've actually he heard people tell me that these were built uh, for runaway slaves. And you know, you can imagine paddle wheel boat in the 1850s and it pulls up to Owego and says, everybody who's running away at Owego, get off here and run up the three tunnels. Uh, you know, uh, men on the left tunnel, women on the right tunnel, couples in the middle tunnel. Uh, you, you know, um, <clears throat> This was not what the Underground Railroad was all about. Um, the Underground Railroad was about people helping other people in violation of federal law. And what's fascinating about the Underground Railroad is that when we venerate it, for example, the state of New York requires that the Underground Railroad be taught in the public schools uh, as part of the social science curriculum. Um, and there's something called the Freedom Trails uh, in New York, which is uh, appropriately in the uh, Department of Tourism. So, so we tie education to tourism to history. Um, it, what's fascinating is, is what we are, of course, venerating and celebrating is lawbreakers. We're venerating people who openly uh, violate federal law or more often surreptitiously violate federal law. And of course, the reason it is the Underground Railroad is because it is illegal to help a slave escape. The Constitution of the United States, Article 4, Section 2, Paragraph 3, you know, don't leave home without one, um, says no person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. Uh, and you can, of 
course, see that this was written uh, with lawyers in mind. It, it obfuscates it. It doesn't use the word fugitive. It doesn't use the word slave. The d idea was to hide what the convention was doing because, as members of the con de Connecticut delegation said, some people in their state would not be happy if the Constitution used the word slave, so we should use a description. And the description here is if you are held to service or labor under the laws thereof, that is, if you are a slave in Virginia or in North Carolina and you escape into another state, no law or regulation of that state can free you, but rather you shall be returned on demand of the person to whom you owe the labor. Uh, this leads to two federal statutes, the Fugitive Slave Law of 1793 and the more famous and more draconian Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. Um, and it leads to um, that massive law enforcement, and ultimately it leads to people who are um, refusing to go along with this law enforcement. And as we sit in a room dedicated to the uh, greatness of Justice Jackson and to the, his uh, skill as a prosecutor at Nuremberg, and we look at some of the faces of the people who Jackson uh, appropriately uh, prosecuted to their conviction and their execution, um, it's worth recalling, of course, that had the people of Germany had the same spirit as many of the people of upstate New York or Ohio or Massachusetts, that perhaps there would not have been a Nuremberg trial because people of Ger in Germany would have, in fact, created their own Underground Railroad. During World War II, of course, we know of the example of the Danish people who did precisely that when the, when the Germans said that every, Dane, every Jew in Denmark has to show up with a yellow star, the king of Denmark sewed a star on his coat and came out in public. And uh, virtually no Danish Jews were uh, sent to concentration camps, and the Danish people uh, put them in boats and took them to neutral Sweden. Um, now, that's an example of not an underground railroad, but I suppose an underground, uh, an underwater, above water uh, boating exercise. But it's the same thing. It is doing something in violation of law which is wrong for the sake of preserving human beings and for saving preserving dignity. So let me talk briefly about the legislation and the uh, litigation surrounding the Underground Railroad and the Fugitive Slave Law. The fugitive, first Fugitive Slave Law was passed in 1793. Um, it simply provides a process by which the owner of a fugitive slave can get a warrant from any judge, state or federal, local magistrate, local mayor, anybody who has any authority to give out any legal paperwork, can give you a certificate of removal. Uh, you bring the person before this magistrate, judge, city councilman, alderman, whatever it is, justice of the peace. Person gives you a certificate of removal. You now have the authority to bring your fugitive slave back to uh, the South. The problem with this, of course, is that this is an age before there are photographs, before there's DNA, before there are fingerprinting. And so if my slave runs away and my slave is 24 years old and he's five foot seven and he weighs about 140 pounds, then I come up from Virginia and I have a certificate from a Virginia judge saying that I am looking for John uh, who is five foot f uh, six and weighs 140 pounds and is about 25 years of old. Now, there are a lot of people that will fill that description. And if I can't find the slave I'm looking for, I might find somebody else who fits the description. And I grab this person, bring him before the judge. And of course, this person says, I'm not this guy. Well, if I've in fact grabbed someone who is a free black living in, say, New York, uh, that person is probably not going to be sent back because the judge is going to say, I'm sorry, you've got the wrong guy. This guy has lived here all his life. We know him. We know his family. You've grabbed the wrong one. But if I am shrewd enough to find somebody who isn't known in the community, who might be a free black, but who's moved from somewhere else, or if I'm in a big city like New York where the judges are not going to know who's a free black and who's uh, a resident and who is not, then I'm in the position to kidnap somebody. Uh, also, of course, if I grab somebody here in Jamestown and I uh, knock him on the head and bring him to the judge in Buffalo, the judge in Buffalo isn't going to know whether he was a free black in Jamestown or not. So in order to counteract <clears throat> 
the real threat of kidnapping because slaves were very valuable. They were worth hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Um, I just saw, I was in at the Buffalo Public Library uh, yesterday, and they have two um, what are essentially auction catalogs of slaves from South Carolina in 1860. And so this is, these are lists of people being sold at auction. And on one of these pieces of paper, they have the prices realized. And so these slaves were sold anywhere between two and three hundred dollars for young children or very old people to as much as fifteen hundred dollars for some of the slaves. So this is a lot of money, and this is a time when, when you know, people worked for a dollar a day. It's a lot easier to kidnap somebody and sell them for three hundred dollars. That's a year's wages for not doing very much. Uh, so northern states pass what are called personal liberty laws. Personal liberty laws essentially say that if you want to remove a African-American from our state, you have to go to a state judge, not a federal judge, and you have to provide proof beyond the minimal requirement of the federal law, which was simply an affidavit. And um, the goal of these laws was, in fact, to protect free blacks, but the secondary goal was to frustrate the constitutional claims of masters who actually did find their fugitive slaves, because many Northerners found the notion of grabbing somebody in your neighborhood and enslaving that person to be completely wrong and immoral. Now, this doesn't mean that all northern whites were racially egalitarians in the, in the, in the 19th century. They were not. Uh, in Pennsylvania, for example, blacks had been able to vote until 1837 when the Pennsylvania legislature uh, passed legislation and the Pennsylvania Supreme Court agreed with it and then there's a constitutional change and suddenly blacks can't vote in Pennsylvania. So, so this, is not, this is not a world of racial egalitarianism, but it is a world where even people who don't think blacks should be equal who don't think blacks are equal, nevertheless also don't think they should be slaves. Um, in 1858, when Lincoln is running for um, the US Senate in, in Illinois, um, Stephen Douglas, who's his opponent and who is a thoroughgoing racist and a race baiter, and by the way, if any of you ever read the Lincoln-Douglas debates, you should understand that they are sanitized. Uh, Douglas never uses the word Negro. He uses a different word, which is uh, too impolite to put in print today. And it was too impolite to put in print in the late 1850s. So when the first transcripts of the uh, uh, appear as, as printed books, they substitute the word nigger for Negro because they don't want uh, uh, the they don't want people to know what a racist Douglas was. But in these debates. Douglas at one point tells Lincoln that you're, you're in favor of interracial marriage. This is a way of, of defeating Lincoln because they want to, because they, Douglas knows that virtually no white voters in Illinois, and there are only white voters in Illinois, would support interracial marriage. And Lincoln, reflecting, I, I think, a broad sentiment of the North, says, I've lived my 50 years now, uh, and I've never had a black woman as either a slave or a wife, and I think I can survive the rest of my life without ever owning, without ever having a black woman as a slave or a wife. Uh, and just because I don't believe in slavery doesn't mean I believe in racial equality or in uh, marrying black people. Um, there is a middle ground. Uh, now Lincoln would ultimately move towards racial equality. His last speech will be a speech in favor of black suffrage. And one of the people in that audience is um, John Wilkes Booth. And it is after Lincoln endorses black suffrage that Booth decides he has to kill Lincoln. So Lincoln becomes the first martyr to uh, universal adult male suffrage in the United States or the first martyr to black suffrage in the United States. Um, but um, this illustrates the complexity of the world of before the Civil War. So northern states passed these personal liberty laws saying if you're going to remove a slave, you really have to have proof, have to have real proof. And Southerners object to this because they don't want government interference. This is, uh, it sounds very much like a corporation today that says, you know, we don't want government regulations telling us how to run our business. My business is rounding up runaway Negroes, and I don't want the government coming in and telling me that I got to follow some kind of rules. I want to do what I want to do. 
And uh, ultimately, this goes to the Supreme Court in 1842 in a case known as Prigg versus Pennsylvania. Prigg is a farmer in Maryland who joins uh, a neighbor who's a slave owner, and they go to Pennsylvania, and they grab a woman named Margaret Morgan and her three children and her husband, and they bring the Morgan family to a magistrate in Pennsylvania, a justice of the peace, and they say, we want to bring these people back as fugitive slaves. The justice of the peace looks at the record and rules against the slave catchers. Uh, it turns out that Jerry Morgan, Margaret's husband, was actually born in Pennsylvania, so he's clearly not a fugitive slave. Turns out that one of Margaret Morgan's children was also born in Pennsylvania, and since you can't be born a slave in Pennsylvania, that person must also be free. Margaret's status is more ambiguous. Her parents had been slaves, owned by the, uh, the, the, the person who's claiming Margaret, but about the time of the War of 1812, the owner of Margaret's parents had said, you people may go live free I'm no longer going to claim you as my slaves. And they lived in the neighborhood in Pennsylvania for another 20 years or so. Margaret was born, uh, assuming she was free. She's listed in the U.S. Census in 1830 as a free person in Maryland. And um, eventually she moves to Pennsylvania with her husband. And then uh, the widow of the man who had freed Margaret's parents decides to go after Margaret because she's valuable property. And so the one question is, is Margaret actually free or is she a slave? The judge says she's not a slave. She goes free. And so the th four Marylanders leave the courthouse, and then they grab Margaret and her children, and they forcibly take them to Pennsylvania. And so they are then indicted for kidnapping. Forcibly take them to Maryland, I'm sorry. So they are indicted for kidnapping under Pennsylvania law. And eventually Prigg is convicted of kidnapping in Pennsylvania, and his case is appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. And in an eight to one decision, the court declares that the Pennsylvania personal liberty law is unconstitutional because no state may pass any law to interfere with the federal fugitive slave law of 1793. For terms of modern constitutional law doctrine, this is a very early example of the supremacy clause in action. Uh, essentially, the court is saying that the federal law supersedes all state law. The court also says that if there had been no federal law, that is, if Congress repealed the 1793 laws, the state law would still be unconstitutional on the grounds that the right to regulate fugitive slaves was a dormant power of Congress. Some of you may remember shuddering in law school and, and being freaked out by having to learn something about the dormant commerce clause. Well, what we don't teach you in law school, because law professors by and large are uncomfortable with these kinds of things, is the first time a majority opinion endorses the notion of a dormant power of Congress is in Prigg versus Pennsylvania, where Justice Story from Massachusetts says the right to regulate fugitive slaves is a power of Congress that's exclusively in the hands of Congress. And therefore, if Congress didn't pass a law, the state still couldn't protect free blacks. The uh, 1793 law, you may remember, also said that the um, state judges could hear these cases. Justice Story says absolutely they can hear these cases, but he says the federal government cannot require them to hear these cases because that would be commandeering state judges who are not paid by the federal government. So when you think about uh, the notion of unfunded mandates, which is a, a darling of Justice Scalia uh, in uh, recent uh, opinions in the last 10 or 15 years, uh, I, I think that if Justice Scalia were a true devotee of legal history, which he always claims he is, he would have the honesty to say I am endorsing unfunded mandates because that came from Prigg versus Pennsylvania, which was, until Dred Scott, the most pro-slavery decision ever issued by the Supreme Court. So we should at least understand that the, the, where the origin of unfunded mandates comes from. So this is the pro-slavery world of the, of the 19th century. The other way to think about it is the Constitution of the US, done in 1787, is a pro-slavery constitution. The slavery is found in a number of places in the Constitution. The three-fifths clause giving the South a bonus in Congress for the slaves it has. The electoral college, 
Why do we have the Electoral College? Because Madison says at the convention, the best thing would be for the people to directly elect the president. And then he says, but one of the problems with this is our Negroes won't count because of course slaves can't vote. And so if you just had the direct election of the president, Virginians wouldn't get elected president because they would be outvoted by Pennsylvanians and, Mass and people in Massachusetts. Uh, Virginia has the largest population, but 40% of the population are slaves. But if you use the three-fifths clause, which gives Virginia four or five members of Congress solely based on the number of slaves in the state, and then you have the electors based on the number of members of Congress, then the slaves count for electing the president. In 1800, Thomas Jefferson beats John Adams by six electoral votes. Take away from Jefferson and from Adams the electors created by counting slaves, and Adams wins that election. So the Electoral College is, in fact, one of the many pro-slavery clauses in the Constitution, and it's, of course, the one that is still most commonly with us because uh, every four years we have to worry that the person who wins the most votes won't get elected president. And I know that couldn't happen in modern America. Uh, I know it would be impossible for one candidate to have six or 700,000 more votes than the other guy and not win the election, but you know, it's at least a theoretical possibility. Um, so, so we still live with sort of the ghosts of slavery in the Constitution. But in the 19th century, it's a, a thoroughly pro-slavery Constitution. And so the result is that in the North, the opponents of slavery become advocates of states' rights. We always think of states' rights as being a Southern phenomenon, a phenomenon to protect segregation, a, a phenomenon to justify secession. But in the 1840s and 50s, it's the northern states that become the advocates of states' rights. So in a year after Prigg versus Pennsylvania, Massachusetts passes a law which prohibits any police official in Massachusetts from being involved in the return of the fugitive slave, prohibits the use of any jail in Massachusetts to house a fugitive slave, and prohibits any Massachusetts judge from hearing a fugitive slave case. So in other words, what Massachusetts does is to say, if we may not protect our free blacks, then we will not participate in the process of returning fugitive slaves because we can't have a one-sided law. We may respect our obligation to return fugitive slaves, even if we don't like it. You would find many northern judges who would say, this is despicable and disgusting, but it's part of the constitutional bargain. But I'm not going to participate if I can't intervene to protect free blacks who are being kidnapped. So Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio pass laws banning their officials from being involved in fugitive slave cases. Northern judges hear fugitive slave cases and they say, I'm sorry, the Supreme Court says I can't hear this case. Now this is actually a misreading of Prigg, but the northern judges either are purposely misreading Prigg or they don't understand that it's voluntary. But the end result is, is by 1850, Southerners are complaining that they can't get their slaves back because no northern judges will cooperate, no northern police officials will cooperate. And it's one thing to be in southern Pennsylvania and simply run in from Maryland, grab your fugitive slave, and carry your slave back to, to, to Virginia. That's easy to do, or back to Maryland. Uh, it's quite another thing if you have to catch your fugitive slave in Syracuse or in Utica or in Rochester or in Buffalo or in Jamestown, for God's sakes, in the middle of nowhere. How are you going to get? How are you going to get your fugitive slave from Jamestown back to Maryland or Virginia? You've got to cross all of this Western New York and Western Pennsylvania. <laughs> Excuse me. Where there are lots of people who oppose slavery. So this leads to the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. 1850 law allows for the appointment, requires the appointment of a federal commissioner in every county in the United States. So for the first time in the history of the United States, we have federal and law enforcement at the local level. Before 1850, the, I would guess that the only federal official 
in this part of New York was the local postmaster. There were no other federal officials. If you didn't live in, now in Buffalo, of course, there would be uh, uh, eventually a U.S. attorney and a federal judge, and there would be a U.S. marshal, and there would, of course, be customs officials because you've got an international border, um, and there might have been other people. But once you get out of big cities or cities along the border, you would find no federal officials at all except the postmaster. And then suddenly there's a law enforcement officer a U.S. commissioner, and the law enforcement officer is vested with the authority to call on the federal marshal, to call a posse, to call on the U.S. Army, and to call on the local state militia to enforce the fugitive slave law. So you begin to get massive law enforcement at the local level in the north to capture fugitive slaves. This leads to very dramatic results. In uh, the spring of 1851, a slave is uh, seized, brought to a courthouse in Boston. The Fugitive Slave Commissioner is hearing the case, and a crowd of blacks charges into the courtroom, grabs the fugitive slave, a man named Shadrach, and he disappears and ends up in Canada. Uh, the Fillmore administration, uh, from Buffalo, of course, Mr. Fillmore is from Buffalo. Fillmore administration aggressively prosecutes everybody they can find. There are a couple of cases of hung juries. In the 19th century, you almost never get a, six, a second prosecution after a hung jury, but Fillmore insists on prosecuting people uh, after they, they have hung juries because he, he wants convictions. He gets no convictions in Boston. Shortly, uh, that's in the spring of 1851. In the fall of 1851, a slave catcher in Maryland goes to Pennsylvania, just across the border to Christiana, Pennsylvania, where he knows his fugitive slave is hiding out. He comes to the house and says, I'm here to bring you back. And the fugitive slave says, uh, come get me, and fires a pistol at him. And uh, you end up with a firefight. The slave catcher, the slave owner from Maryland is killed. Uh, the slave who kills him takes his pistol, takes the pistol from his dead master and sticks it in his belt, gets on a train, and in broad daylight takes the train from Philadelphia to Rochester, New York, where he goes to the home of Frederick Douglass. He visits Frederick Douglass. The, all the newspapers are, have stories about this. This is like a great crisis, you know? Black people killing white people, how horrible. Slaves killing their masters, this is not acceptable. Frederick Douglass has him spend the night and the next day takes him to the dock in Rochester, puts him on a boat for Canada, and the, uh, the slave who had uh, killed his master hands Douglass the pistol as a souvenir, which Douglass keeps. Uh, that's the Underground Railroad in action. It's not secret doorways, it's not hidden cellars. It's Frederick Douglass in broad daylight in Rochester taking a man to the, to, the, uh, to, to the boat because, of course, nobody would believe that this guy from Pennsylvania had made it all the way to Rochester. In fact, on the train, he has, he has a conversation with a white man about the terrible tragedy in Christiana. And they're talking about this, and all the while he's sitting there feeling the butt of the pistol in his belt just in case he needs it. Um, meanwhile, two weeks after Christiana, a slave is arrested in Syracuse, New York, uh, a man named Jerry, Jerry McHenry. Uh, this arrest is planned by the federal government. Uh, the Fillmore administration decided they wanted to prove, <coughs> excuse me, they wanted to prove they can enforce the fugitive slave law in upstate New York. So they planned to arrest this fugitive slave. They have all the affidavits in order, they have all the information in order, they have the arrest warrant in order, and they decide to do it at a time when the county fair is being held in Syracuse. So there are hundreds or thousands of extra people in town, and there's also a convention of something called the Liberty Party, which is in a, a very small anti-slavery political party. I mean, it's hard to imagine anybody planning anything in a more stupid manner. It's hard to imagine uh, that even Fillmore could be this dumb, uh, but he is. And so the town is full of abolitionists. Jerry is arrested, he's put in jail. The courtroom is mobbed. They 
can't, he, Jerry is manacled, so he can't really run very fast, but they kind of hand him out, put, and he starts running down the streets. The federal marshal catches him, brings him back, puts him in jail. That night, 3,000 people mobbed the jail. They, uh, uh, they give rocks to all the kids and challenge them to see who can, who can uh, hit the gas streetlights with rocks to put the streetlights out. You know, kids are always throwing rocks at streetlights. Now they're told it's okay, do it. Let's see how good you are. Uh, I guess this is the first, you know, this is the other tie to baseball, right? Some of these kids would later become outfielders or pitchers. And they, um, and they mob the jail. Jerry is taken out of the jail. And um, when he's taken out of the jail, there are eight carriages out in front of the jail and seven other black men are standing around and everybody runs around in circles and everybody jumps into a different carriage. So even if they're trying to follow them, they don't know which carriage to follow. It's night, they don't know where Jerry is. And Jerry is kept in hiding for about a week and then he is taken to Canada and the US Marshal figures out when he sees a, a, a carriage with four horses in the area that are not owned by the same person and they're all known to be four fast horses. He realizes what's going on and he pursues this carriage all the way to Oswego. Uh, and in those days there are toll roads. When the carriage comes through, the toll gate is up. When the marshal comes through, they're asking for exact change. And by the time... Um, so the federal marshal gets to Oswego just in time to see Jerry waving from the boat as he goes to Canada. Uh, the Fillmore administration then prosecutes about 11 or 12 people, uh, doesn't get any convictions, they get one hung jury. Oh, I'm sorry, they get one conviction and the guy dies on appeal, everything else is a hung jury. But it's interesting what the min administration does because they're desperate to get convictions. And so um, instead of uh, trying them in Syracuse where the crime took place, because it is going to be tried in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of New York. They try some of them in Buffalo and some of them in Albany. And the reason for that is because Buffalo and Albany are less anti-slavery than Syracuse or Rochester or Utica. And furthermore, of course, it's far more difficult to conduct your defense if you have to bring people all the way from Syracuse to either Albany or Buffalo for the trial. Um, that all takes place in 1851. In 1854, there is a case in w Wisconsin where a slave is seized and is uh, by the local marshal and a abolitionist named uh, uh, Sherman Booth organizes a mob. He literally rides through the streets of Milwaukee, you know, like Paul Revere, um, gets, gets a crowd, they rescue the slave, the slave gets sent off to Canada, Booth gets arrested, he gets put in jail, he uh, is in, in jail under the, on a warrant from the U.S. Marshal. Booth goes to the Supreme Court of Wisconsin, which issues a hab writ of habeas corpus directed at the U.S. Marshal. U.S. Marshal ignores the writ, saying you have no authority. Uh, the Wisconsin Supreme Court then orders the Marshal of the Wisconsin Supreme Court to arrest the U.S. Marshal, which they do. Uh, U.S. Marshal gets put in jail. Booth comes out of jail. U.S. Marshal gets a writ from the U.S. District Court. He gets out of jail. He arrests Booth. They do this twice, this little dance. Um, and then the uh, Wisconsin Supreme Court rules in 1854 uh, that the Fugitive Slave Law is unconstitutional and you can't arrest people for enforcing it. Uh, now, this had never been tested. No state had ever declared a federal law unconstitutional, but there were arguments that the fugitive slave law should be unconstitutional because it did not allow alleged fugitive slaves to testify on their own behalf, it did not allow them to have a jury trial, and uh, there were all sorts of procedure irregularities. And so uh, the court said this law is unconstitutional, and uh, Stephen Abelman, who is the U.S. Marshal, appeals to the U.S. Supreme Court. In those days, of course, the court has to get the record as it does today. And so the Supreme Court writes to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, says, please send the record of this case. The Chief Justice of Wisconsin orders his clerk not to open any mail from the US Supreme Court. <laughs> and so for four years, the case is dormant. And then Wisconsin Supreme Court makes its big mistake. It publishes its opinion. And four years later, they published their opinion, and the Supreme Court says, now we have the record. 
because it's the published record, and the U.S. Supreme Court reverses the Wisconsin court uh, nine to nothing, saying that a state court may not interfere with a federal with the federal courts. So the states' rights people at this time are in the North, and the nationalists are in the South because it's a pro-slavery constitution. Uh, Ironically, Abelman versus Booth is pretty much ignored. There are no citations of Abelman versus Booth for 99 years, from 1859 to 1958. And what case do they cite Abelman versus Booth in in 1958? Little Rock. Cooper versus Aaron, the Little Rock case where the governor of, of, uh, of Arkansas says he can ignore the federal courts. And the court says, no, we decided in this fugitive slave case that states can't overrule federal courts. And so this pro-slavery decision comes back to force integration of Central High at Little Rock. So this is an example of, of the Underground Railroad and the federal law. Um, two more quick examples, and, and then I will be out of time. Um, the first takes place in Oberlin, Ohio in 1858. A fugitive slave is seized. Um, there is a, uh, he's taken from Oberlin to the nearby town of Wellington, where they put him in the hotel to wait for the next train to Columbus. A, mo a group of people in Oberlin hear about this, and hundreds of people from Oberlin go the 10 miles to Wellington. They surround the hotel, and two different groups of uncoordinated attacks, uh, one, uh, two different groups of people in the mob go into the hotel, they grab the fugitive slave, and uh, he is rescued, ends up in Canada, never heard from again. Uh, more than 50 people are prosecuted for this. Uh, they sit in jail in Cleveland for a very long time. Um, in the end, there are two convictions, and then the, the federal government simply gives up because it takes them a year to get two convictions, and at this rate, it will take them forever to prosecute everybody. Uh, meanwhile, the Ohio Supreme Court comes within one vote of issuing a writ of habeas corpus for the two people who were convicted. And had the Ohio Supreme Court issued the writ of habeas corpus, the governor of Ohio, Salmon P. Chase, whose picture is out there because he's later Chief Justice, Salmon P. Chase says that he will call out the Ohio militia to take these people from federal custody. Um, so this is the other piece of the Underground Railroad. I should add, by the way, the Christiana case, where the guy went to Canada by way of Frederick Douglass, the Fillmore administration has 47 people arrested for this, for not helping the federal marshal. They're not accused of shooting the, the master, they're simply accused of being bystanders who refuse to help the federal marshal. They are indicted for treason. Uh, treason, of course, is making war against the United States. Uh, the um, Fillmore, who is a reasonably good lawyer in Buffalo before he becomes a politician, uh, insists on a treason prosecution uh, the Secretary of State, Daniel Webster, a reasonably good lawyer, uh, says, fine, let's have a treason pro pro prosecution. The local U.S. attorney is opposed to the treason prosecution because he says it's not treason. You know, we can nail him under the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, but not treason. So we have the largest treason trial in the United States history is in Pennsylvania in 1851. And uh, in the first and one of the defense attorneys, if any of you have seen the uh, Lincoln movie, one of the defense attorneys is Thaddeus Stevens, who will later uh, become uh, one of the greatest supporters of, of emancipation and black freedom after the Civil War. And in the first trial, the U.S. Supreme Court justice who's riding circuit and who hears the case holds that this is not treason and all of the prosecutions are dropped. So, so, so the Fugitive Slave Law is one embarrassment after another for the national administration. Final, um, final case, which is not a fugitive slave case, but another case that borders on fugitive slaves is Lemon versus New York. When New York ends slavery, uh, in, in 1799, New York passes a law saying that all slaves, all people born in New York will be born free, and therefore slavery will literally die out because the, the children of slaves will be born free. But New York also passes a law saying that visitors can come to New York for up to nine months with their slaves. 
New York is, after all, uh, a major uh, tourist destination. Then, as now, people want to go up to Saratoga Springs. Uh, uh, slave owners go there every summer because it's a much nicer place than the Deep South. I mean, who wants to be in South Carolina in the summer before they invent air conditioning and ice machines? So you go up to you go up to Saratoga Springs, and so there's this nine-month law which allows masters to come into the state for up to nine months. In 1841, New York repeals the nine-month law. And in 1852, 1841, the nine-month law is repealed. In 1852, a family from Virginia is moving to Texas, and the best way to get to Texas is to go from Richmond to New York by boat, and then take a boat directly to New Orleans. It's the only direct passage to the Gulf Coast. They get to New York with their eight slaves. They rent a hotel room. They put their eight, lock the eight slaves in the hotel room, and they go out for dinner. And they come back to find the uh, local sheriff is there with a writ of habeas corpus asking why these eight colored citizens of Virginia have been locked up in, a, in the hotel room. And this habeas corpus writ is acquired by a man named Louis Napoleon. Louis Napoleon is a black dock worker. And Louis Napoleon shows up in a number of cases. He works on the docks in New York and this is really in another way the Underground Railroad works. Louis Napoleon is always on the lookout for fugitive slaves or for people who are being illegally kept as slaves. And when he sees these eight blacks taken off, he follows them to the hotel, finds out where they are, goes, gets the writ of habeas corpus. And in 1860, the um, New York Court of Appeals rules that the moment these slaves set foot in New York, they were free because they were not fugitive slaves, because their master voluntarily brought them to New York. And when South Carolina secedes in 18, December 1860, South Carolina, in its declaration of the causes of secession, complains about the decision in the Lemon case. Rather, in other words, than seceding because they believe in states' rights, the southern states complain in their secession documents that it is the northern states that are using their states' rights to protest slavery and to protect black people. And so the South wants to leave the Union not because of what the federal government has done to them, but rather because the federal government isn't sufficiently powerful in oppressing northern states that want to protect free blacks uh, and fugitive slaves. And let me leave you with that. Uh, I, we're slightly over time, but probably I can take a couple of questions. Or... We, I have more time. How much more time do I have? Oh, really? Oh, well, let me tell you all the things I didn't talk about. That. Well, well, let me open it up to questions then. Anybody have any questions? Could you tell us a little bit about, Greg mentioned that you were uh, recently quoted in a, in a Supreme Court decision. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, in, in a second, let, let me see if there are any questions about this. I, I mean, I, I can always talk about that, but do any of you have any questions? Or co Yes. McPherson's novel, Battle Cry of Freedom. The whole it's not a novel, it's, it's a history. Well, it's, it's, it is uh, a historical story. And um, there's a lot of stuff in there regarding the initial slave that was taken off and he found his way up to New York. Do you have any insight on that? And then ultimately he was brought back to South Carolina. Um, I'm not sure what you're talking about. So I don't know. I can tell you this. There are a number of cases involving slaves, particularly in port cities like Charleston or Richmond, who get on ships, or Savannah, who hide themselves on ships and end up in the north. Uh, and they are, of course, fugitive slaves. They are part of the Underground Railroad. But what's interesting about most of the Underground Railroad it is really about the initiative of individual slaves who choose to run away. There is no sort of vast organization, with the exception of Harriet Tubman, who's very unique. There aren't people going into the, there are a couple of other examples. There's a woman named Delia Webster in, in, who goes into Kentucky. But by and large, most fugitive slaves are not being led north by anyone. They are figuring out how to do it on their own.
and of course, it's it's very it's very difficult. The the most famous fugitive slave is probably Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass grows up in Maryland. Uh, through a variety of circumstances, he is able to learn to read and write when he is a child. Um, when he is a young, when he was an, when he's an old teenager, when he's about seventeen or eighteen, he is rented out to a uh, to the to work on the docks in Baltimore, where he becomes a ship's caulker, and he learns how to caulk ships. And uh, by this time, Douglas is literate, and Douglas is uh, essentially going to work every day on his own, and he wants to be free, and he decides he's going to run away. Um, and he makes elaborate plans to run away. He acquires a sailor's suit, so he looks like he's a, a sailor. Um, he is, of course, working on the docks, so he can kind of talk like a sailor. You know, he understands how to behave, how to look like a sailor. And he borrows from a free black sailor something called a seaman's protection. Now, this is a fascinating document because the the collectors of the ports for every port in the United States would issue a federal document called a seaman's protection. And what this document did is to say that the person described in this document, and it's always, of course, a description only by hair and eye color and size and name, that this person is a citizen of the United States and entitled to the protection of the United States. Now, what's fascinating is, is blacks are clearly not considered citizens in the United States by the federal government at any time in this period. Chief Justice Tawney says this in Dred Scott, but well before Dred Scott, uh, various attorney generals had said blacks can't get passports, for example, because they're not citizens. But nevertheless, the collectors of the port give these seamen's protections to free black sailors, and the maritime industry is probably the most integrated industry in the country because uh, ships are willing to take anybody who's willing to ship out for two years because it's a very onerous job. And so Douglas borrows the papers of a free black sailor, and he goes to the train station in Baltimore and gets on the train doesn't buy a ticket at the ticket window because he's afraid at the ticket window they'll actually look at his papers. So he gets on the train. The conductor comes to Douglas and says, uh, and Douglas takes out his money to buy his ticket. And the conductor says, I assume you have your free papers with you. Uh, now, Maryland has a fairly large free black population, so it's not uncommon to have a free black. And Douglas says, I never take my free papers to sea. Uh, he's pretending that he's just come in uh, on a boat. And the conductor says, well, I assume you have something to prove you're free. He says, yes, I do. I have a certificate with the Eagle of the United States on it that will take me to any port in the world. And he pulls out the Siemens Protection. The conductor simply looks at what it is. It's a Siemens Protection with a gold eagle of the United States. And he takes Douglas's money and moves on. Now, the guy who he borrowed this from was about five feet six. Douglas is 6'2". Uh, had the conductor actually looked at the Siemens paper, Douglas would have probably been arrested as a fugitive slave. But Douglas has an enormous number of advantages going for him, including the fact that he grew up essentially as a, as, a, as a child slave in an entirely white household. He was basically the companion for a young boy, so he could speak not like a plantation slave, but he spoke like he was white. And so the conductor undoubtedly must have thought Douglas was a free black from the north because he didn't speak the way the conductor assumed that slaves were supposed to speak. Furthermore, Douglas was dressed as a sailor. He acted as a sailor. He talked like a sailor. Uh, for those of you who have teenage kids, you know that every year there's this uh, international talk like a pirate day. And, and, uh, and Douglas was, you know, talking like a sailor. And so the conductor just waves him on through. So, but that, once he gets to New York, he then links up with free blacks in New York who are the Underground Railroad. And so once he gets to New York City, a free black minister uh, helps him um, figure out what to do with his life. He first tells him you can't stay in New York because you're going to be picked up by slave catchers. They're all over the city. A fugitive slave law works in New York City. This is the 1830s. 
And furthermore, uh, you're six foot two and you're going to stand out. People are going to notice you right away. You got to get out of here. And so Douglas goes to New Bedford, Massachusetts, which is a seafaring town. And he begins to work on the boats in New Bedford. New Bedford is very anti-slavery. No slave catcher in his right mind would go to New Bedford. It's full of fugitive slaves, but it's also full of abolitionists. And um, you, you couldn't get a slave out of New Bedford. So he stays in New Bedford for a while. And then he becomes a, uh, an abolitionist speaker. And he spends the next uh, six years going around the country giving talks. And then he writes his autobiography. And when he writes his autobiography, A Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, An American Slave, that's the title, he does something that no, many, many fugitive slaves had written narratives, they'd written autobiographies, but Douglass does something that none of these others have done. He actually says where he's from. He says in the book who his master is. He names the plantation he came from. This, of course, makes him a marked man. Because now his master knows who he is, knows where he is, and somebody could go get him. And then Douglas goes to England for two years because he, it's not safe to be in the U.S. And while he's in England, uh, some British women raise money to buy his freedom. So when he comes back, he's a free man, moves to Rochester and starts a newspaper. So that's in part how the Underground Railroad works. Uh, it, started, it starts with the slave making the decision. So there's a couple of cases in Charleston where slaves hide on boats and they end up in New York. Uh, there's a, uh, there's a, a three-year or four-year controversy between New York and Virginia over a slave who sneaks on a boat in Norfolk and ends up in New York. And the governor of Virginia is trying to extradite not the fugitive slave, but the free black sailors that helped him escape. And the governors keep writing Governor Seward, who's an out-and-out -out abolitionist, and they say, we want these guys back. And Seward says, well, they didn't commit any crime. And of course, you know, these letters take weeks to go back and forth or months. And, and they said, well, they stole property. Well, Seward said, what property did they steal? He's playing games with them. And they say, well, would they stole slaves? He said, well, slaves aren't property here in New York, so we can't arrest them because they didn't commit any crime in New York. And goes back and back. And finally, Seward writes to the governor of New Virginia, and he says, look, we believe in states' rights in New York. We believe in this. Our state has a right to define crimes in New York. Now, if you want to abandon all states' rights arguments, maybe we could together go to the federal government and get a law passed about this. And of course, the Virginians immediately back off because that's the last thing they want to do. So this is the kind of controversies. And these are going on and on throughout the 1840s and 50s. I hope I answered your question. Leaving Virginia, maybe you're trying to get to New York. You got to go through all, you know, through Pennsylvania, through tough territory. You need probably a lot of help. Um, fugitive slaves sometimes they're really lucky. You know, if you are if you are a fugitive slave crossing Kentucky from Kentucky into Ohio, Southern Ohio is the Deep South in many ways. Uh, Southern Ohio was settled by people from Kentucky and Virginia. It's very hostile to free blacks and fairly pro-slavery. On the other hand, there are a couple of Quaker settlements in Southern Ohio. And in Cincinnati, there's a fairly big free black population. And of course, Salmon Chase, who is the most important abolitionist attorney in the, in the period before the Civil War, lives in Cincinnati. So if you're lucky, you go into Cincinnati and you end up running into somebody who says, I better take you to, to Mr. Chase, he'll help you. Or I better take you to the Quaker down the road and he'll help you. Otherwise, or you just meld into the free black community and you hide. Um, but yeah, go, getting, th th this is why most of the fugitive slaves come from Kentucky and Virginia. It's, nobody's running away from Mississippi. If you saw the movie 12 Years a Slave, uh, and of course Solomon Northrup is from Albany, and he is kidnapped and, and sold into slavery in Louisiana, there is no way that Solomon Northrup can get out of Louisiana. Maybe if he'd been in New Orleans, he could have gotten onto a ship. But, but once you're upriver in Louisiana, forget it. You know, you're in Bayou Country, you're in the middle of nowhere. How are you going to run away? 
Uh, and, and Solomon Northrup has the advantage of being literate and actually know where he, knowing where he's running to. 90% of their slaves are not literate. They have not dealt with a money economy. They haven't bought or sold anything in their lives. They've never seen a map. They have no idea where freedom is other than it's north. And so it's really the very extraordinary and the very lucky who escape. And yes, they're sometimes helped by northerners, and there are occasional prosecutions of northerners for helping fugitive slaves escape. Uh, there are also a couple of prosecutions in the south for people who help fugitive slaves escape. There are very few southern whites who, who will help a slave escape. Uh, there are a couple of northerners, uh, again, a woman named Delia Webster goes into Kentucky. She spends eight years in the Kentucky penitentiary for, for trying to help slaves escape from Kentucky. Um, and um, there is one case I know of, of a white man who was prosecuted for helping slaves escape. Uh, in Richmond, there is a slave named Henry Brown. Henry Brown has a very good singing voice and he sings in a church choir and it's an integrated church choir. So he has white friends as well as black friends. He's a slave in Virginia, but his master lets him you know, go to the church choir. That's a good thing. You like religious slaves because the Bible teaches that slavery is a good thing. Uh, the Bible, I, I mean, I mean, you know, the Bible is very pro-slavery. Uh, it, you know, read, read Paul's letter to Philemon, uh, where the slave runs away to Paul, and Paul sends the slave back. You know, fugitive slave laws is ordained by by the New Testament, and Southern ministers could tell you that over and over again. Uh, so, uh, so, so Henry Brown is a slave in, in Richmond, and he's reasonably okay with being a slave. You know, he goes to work, he goes to the church choir, he's married, his wife's owned by somebody else, but he gets to see his wife every few days. And then his wife gets, is the owner of his wife decides to sell her. And Henry Brown goes to his owner and says, will you please buy my wife and children? And the owner says, no, I don't need any more slaves. Uh, you'll find another wife, don't worry about it. And the last time Henry Brown sees his wife is when she is chained up, being marched out of Richmond with, her, with his kids to be sold south. And at that point, Henry Brown decides to run away. He goes to one of his friends in the choir who builds a large wooden crate, puts Henry in the wooden crate, takes it to the railroad station, has arrows saying this side up, which of course you know means they're gonna turn it upside down. And so Henry Brown rides from Virginia to Philadelphia uh, about half the time he's upside down in the crate, which you know he passes out, you know, I mean, it's really awful. But he gets to Philadelphia, and the crate is delivered to the offices of the uh, Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society. The delivery truck comes. They deliver the crate on a wagon. They take the crate in. They open the crate, and out pops Henry Brown, who then forever after is known as Henry Box Brown. Uh, and he writes an autobiography, the narrative of the life of Henry Box Brown. And there he is popping out of the box. He becomes very famous. And a couple of years later, his white friend in Virginia boxes up another slave, and the guy's caught and sentenced to eight years in the penitentiary for, for, for theft, for stealing slaves. So Henry Brown becomes free. Henry Brown goes to England and becomes an entertainer and a singer. And his white friend rots in the Richmond jail for eight years. Uh, and that's a very unusual story because it's a very rare moment where a white southerner helps a slave escape like that. Other questions? I'm not missing anybody's hand. Yes? Okay, the, 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 the concept of federalism is, is, a, is an incredibly difficult one to, to explain in, in a short time. But, so let me give you a kind of a quick and dirty answer, okay? The structure of our government is that we have a national constitution where the national government has a certain set of national powers. And we have states with ha which have certain powers which are entirely in the hands of the states. For example, if you get hit by a car walking out of this building, and you have to go to court and sue, and I'm sure there are many people here who will represent you on a, in a drop of a hat. Um, that would be decided under state law because, state, because personal injury law 
with a few exceptions like asbestos cases. Personal injury law is local law. If you get married or divorced or have child custody issues, that's decided by state law with the exception that if your state laws violate the national constitution, then they're unconstitutional. So for example, uh, until 1967, uh, 17 states in the United States made it illegal for people of different races to get married. They were called uh, miscegenation laws, you, you could, you, or anti-miscegenation laws, actually. You, so, you, so blacks could not marry whites. In a wonderfully titled case of Loving versus Virginia involving uh, a couple, Richard and Mildred Loving, Mildred was black, Richard was white. They grew up in Virginia. They got married in, in Washington, D.C. They came back to Virginia, and they got arrested for illegal cohabitation because they could not be legally married in Virginia. And they were sentenced to either like 20 years in jail or never return to Virginia at the same time. So that Mildred could go visit her parents and Richard could go visit his parents, but they couldn't come back to Virginia together. And finally, the Supreme Court says that the Virginia anti-miscegenation law is unconstitutional because people have a constitutional right to marry whoever they want. Um, and, and so that's an example of how the federal constitution interferes with general state law. But on other issues like child custody, on how old you have to be to be married, on inheritance laws. This is all local state law. And then you have you know, big federal law like um, interstate commerce or um, taxes on imported goods or, or crossing state lines to commit certain crimes. Again, uh, if I go rob the local grocery store, I'm going to be charged in New York. If I rob a bank, I'm going to be charged in federal court because the banks are insured by the Federal uh, Deposit Insurance Corporation, and therefore it's a federal crime to rob a bank. Uh, but so, so the, the, this is the, the, the nature of federalism. And then there's this murky area where both the states and the federal government have the right to both pass laws and regulate things. And federalism is always complicated. Uh, and part of the notion of states' rights is, is that the states retain powers to do certain things that the federal government can't do or the federal government can't interfere with. And this has been a constant tension in American history. Uh, for most of our history, the claim of states' rights has been the claim of uh, the white South saying the federal government can't make us do things like let black people eat at restaurants with white people or let blacks use the same bathrooms as whites or uh, force their kids to go to school with our kids. Uh, and they were beaten down on most of these, although the current Supreme Court seems to be uh, edging away from that in, in rather scary ways. Uh, but in the period leading up to the Civil War, there were states' rights claims by both the North and the South, and because the Constitution was pro-slavery, Northerners invent these states' rights argument to protect fugitive slaves. So that's the complicated nature of federalism. Other questions? How am I doing for time? Are, are, we, are we, we have more time? Well, I have, to, I have to speak in Buffalo later today, so I think I, I probably have to go. Let me quickly answer the question you asked about the Supreme Court, which is yesterday the Supreme Court decided a case called uh, uh, Town of Greece versus Galloway. Uh, the town government in Greece, New York, which is just outside Rochester, insists on opening every town meeting with a explicitly evangelical Protestant prayer. And uh, this was challenged in the Supreme Court on the grounds that while it might be okay to open with a non-denominational prayer or even with a series of denominational prayers, you know, one from every faith every so often, uh, to simply have a, a essentially evangelical Protestant prayer every time is an establishment of religion. And especially at a town meeting, a town council where people are going to the town council to ask the town council to do things for them, it's very uncomfortable. I can only imagine what it would be like uh, for um, 
say, somebody who is an observant Jew who walks into the town council with a yarmulke on to first have to sit through an evangelical Protestant prayer and then go to the town council and ask them for a variance on, on, uh, on, on some kind of reg you know, regulation or ask for a stop sign at the corner, knowing that the town councilmen were staring at this guy and noticing that he's not saying the prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Uh, and so I submitted what is called an amicus brief, which is a friend of the court brief. It was on behalf of me and 37 other uh, constitutional historians and historians of, of religion in America, arguing that this violates the First Amendment and violates the historical precedents of the United States. We pointed out that where, as George Washington might have prayers at the beginning of, of speeches and things, they were always non-denominational. They were never <clears throat> they were never sectarian, and that all of the framers of the First Amendment believed that if there's any kind of public prayer, it must be non-sectarian. It can't be denominational. Uh, unfortunately for me, uh, Justice Kagan cited my brief in dissent because um, five justices have now said that it is okay for the majority of the population to essentially uh, shove their religious beliefs down the throats of everybody else in the community. Uh, I think yesterday's uh, decision is, is, a, is a catastrophe for fundamental liberty. And, um, and when these things happen, they will come back to haunt people in ways that they don't expect. Because I just wonder what will happen if in 10 years from now, the demographics of Greece, New York change, and you suddenly discover that uh, Greece, New York has become a, um, a nice place to live if you're from Greece and suddenly there's a Greek Orthodox majority, and they bring in a Greek Orthodox priest in full regalia with his big square beard, and he gives the prayer every day how these evangelical Protestants will feel. Or, and this is probably more likely, that as is happening in many communities, the majority of the community becomes either Hindu or Muslim. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, I sort of pray in my own re weird way that, uh, that every, every, uh, P every person from South Asia moving to Rochester moves to Greece. And, and in five years, they begin their town council meetings with a mullah or with a, uh, uh, a Hindu priest uh, getting up and giving the invocation um, because then we would have, you know, what goes around comes around. Uh, but, but the real problem, you see, is that, that in, a, in, a, in a pluralistic society and in a society that takes religious freedom seriously, the government has no business being in the business of religion. The government should not be telling you what to pray or when to pray or how to pray or who to pray to. Uh, and I think it is shocking uh, that, the, that the majority of the Supreme Court reached the decision it reached. Uh, and the weirdest one is the concurrence by Justice Thomas, who sort of seems to be saying if they want to in fact have an official religion in the town of Greece, that would be okay with him. Uh, I'm wondering what planet he grew up on. And thank you all. Thank you.